Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone for joining, wherever you might be in the world. Um, I hope your family is safe and healthy during this time. Um, thank you for joining today's uh, webinar, a uh, joint webinar uh, between Elusive Networks and Enterprise Strategy Group. Um, before we begin, uh, I will just make a couple of announcements, one of which is this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and you will receive a recording in a follow-up email. Um, secondly, we always appreciate questions and we will reserve time for Q&A at the end of today's webinar. You can ask questions in the Q&A um, tab in the webinar control panel and assuming we have enough time, we'll answer uh, your question during today's webinar. Um, and that's it, I think, for now. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Tony Palmer of Enterprise Strategy Group. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having us today. Um, uh, as I said, uh, um, as was said, I am Tony Palmer. I'm with Enterprise Strategy Group. Um, and um, so ESG is an integrated IT analyst um, research, validation, and strategy firm, as it says right here. Right, our goal basically is to help our clients and their customers achieve their uh, achieve business results through our research and advisory services, consulting, and custom content solutions. Um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Tony Palmer. Uh, I am a senior validation analyst, and what I do is um, hands-on testing and analysis of uh, solutions of cybersecurity and IT solutions and um, uh, I'm also joined by my colleague John Oltzik. Uh, I'll let him introduce himself. John will talk a little bit about deception technology and a little bit about the state of the market uh, today and why it's um, needed and then uh, we'll talk about the actual testing and validation that we performed. Thank you Tony. This is John Oltzik. Hello, everyone. I'm a senior principal analyst and fellow at ESG. I've been in the industry for the IT industry for over 30 years and in cybersecurity for over 20. I started the cybersecurity practice in 2003, and I'm uh, excited and, and happy to be here today to talk to you about deception technology. So if you go to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit, put this in the perspective of some research that we've done. So we did some research a few, uh, or recently, and it was a survey of 412 security and IT professionals. And the IT professionals had, a security, had security responsibilities. These people worked at enterprise organizations, which we defined as 1,000 employees or more, or they worked at large mid-market organizations, which we defined as 500 to 999 employees. And we asked a basic question, is threat detection and response, how would you compare it to two years ago? Is it more difficult? Is it easier than it was two years ago? And as you can see by our research, 76% of the people that we surveyed said that threat detection and response is either much more difficult than it was two years ago or more difficult, somewhat more difficult. 45%, as you can see, said much more difficult. Now think about that in the context of what's happened over the last two years. We've had plenty of data breaches and cyber attacks in the news. Uh, as a result, we've made more investments in our cybersecurity tools. There's been more innovation, a lot of startups, a lot of innovative technologies based on things like machine learning. And we've had two years to understand what the adversaries are doing and we've trained our cybersecurity people accordingly. Despite all of that, all of that activity, all that positive, positive activity for defenders, 76% of those we surveyed said the threat detection and response is more difficult than it was two years ago. Now this begs the obvious question as to, well, why do they believe that? And we surveyed those people who said that things were more difficult. We asked them that question. So Tony, if you can go on to the next slide. So here are the results, and I'm going to start with uh, the highest percentage. 34% said the volume and sophistication of threats has increased. So that makes sense. The bad guys aren't standing still. So this means that as defenders, we need more threat intelligence skills. 
We need to manage our threat intelligence better. And we need to operationalize our threat intelligence better, meaning when we see a bad or a malicious IOC, we need to turn that into blocking rules right away. 17% um, said the threat detection and response workload has increased. There's more work for people. And think of this in the context of the fact that we have a global cybersecurity skill shortage, which means we're short staffed and we may not have the necessary cybersecurity advanced skills that we need. And this is especially true of security analysts, threat analysts, people who would be involved in threat detection and response. 16% said the attack surface has grown. Think about the last two years, we've added public cloud, SaaS applications. There's a lot more mobility, especially related to the pandemic response, IoT devices, a lot of digital transformation applications. So we've used, we've deployed new components, new components have just come to the network organically, bigger attack surface. And, and the last one I'll talk about is threat detection and response is dependent on many manual processes at my organization, 13%. And oftentimes threat detection and response is, is tribal knowledge, meaning you hire some very uh, advanced skilled people in your SOC and you let them take care of it. And that doesn't scale. And that also doesn't translate when those people leave the company to pursue greener pastures. So if you put these all together, the threat landscape has gotten more dangerous and we are, have taken steps back. We're not as well prepared as we can be. We're fighting more fires. All really bad things in spite of our investment, all really bad signs of the situation at hand. So if we go to the next slide, just some, some considerations for threat detection and response. So threat prevention is an easy win. What do I mean by that? Meaning as a CISO, anything I can do to reduce the attack surface, to deploy advanced technology that's better at detection, uh, think of machine learning again, operationalize threat intelligence, anything I can do that prevents the bad guys from attacking me or makes them move on to the next person, anything I can do there will ease, is an easy win, meaning that it will, decrease the amount of work my team can, has to do, and especially it can let them focus more on threat detection and response. A second bullet, threat detection demands high fidelity alerts covering the attack surface. One of the things we hear oftentimes is the alert storm issue. So we've deployed more tools, all of them are giving us alerts, some of them are false positives. Somehow we have to string those together because threat actors don't just attack endpoints, they don't just attack networks, they're stringing an attack along a kill chain over a period of time. So we need high fidelity alerts that understand that kill chain, that can give us that context over a period of time. And finally, incident response should include automated actions and full investigations determine, to determine attack scope. So this again really requires visibility and an understanding of an attack as it progresses. And that way we know what we need to remediate quickly to just block the attack, quarantine a system, uh, force a system to a, a remediation VLAN, things like that, that we know what to do immediately to stop the bleeding but we also understand where we need to investigate. So much more deep forensic investigations, uh, retrospective investigations to understand the scope of an attack, which systems may have been impacted, what the bad guy did when they were in the network, and what we can do then to uh, stratify or uh, increase our defenses so that we can prevent the next similar attack. So now what does all this have to do with deception technology? If we go to the next slide, uh, there's a famous quote from my old friend, Bruce Schneier. He said years ago, security is a process, not a product. And what he meant was there was a lot of money being spent on firewalls and money being spent on IDS, IPS solutions and antivirus software. But 
all of those technologies are only as good as the way they're deployed, the way they're managed, and how we understand what they're telling us, the processes around security. Now we at ESG took that quote and we said, really this applies to deception technology too. So deception is a process, not a product. Now, the reason why I think that's important is because deception technology for years has been equated with things like honeypot servers. Now these were decoys or these are decoys or lures, but they're only good if the bad guy hits that honeypot server. So they could be sitting in the network and um, maybe the cyber attack doesn't involve where the honeypot is, is deployed. Uh, maybe somehow the cyber adversary has some feeling that that could be a decoy and avoids it. Uh, that's the product mentality of deception. It's a process meaning it is deployed on assets across the enterprise. And it's a process because we can see, by, because of the deception technology, we understand the movement of an adversary. So thus we understand their behavior a lot more. We understand what they wanna do, what they wanna accomplish. We can gather more threat intelligence. And then we can turn that into a process for reinforcing our controls, for analyzing our adversaries. So it gets much deeper when we consider deception as a process and not a product. If you go to the next slide. So the first thing, I talked about the need for quick wins in prevention. Well, deception technology at scale, the way Elusive can do it, introduces a whole bunch of confusion for cyber adversaries. So rather than one system that they, they want to look for, there are five systems or 10 systems, however you configure it. So that confusion leads to prevention. It's going to dif dif dissuade uh, kind of your average hacker or your cyber criminal, um, but it will also confuse a state-sponsored adversary. And those are the people who are responsible for the advanced persistent threats, the APTs. This is the line of defense that you're looking for. Um, deception technology can be a foolproof method for threat detection. Well, like a honeypot, if a bad guy hits a deception asset, a decoy, we know that something malicious is happening because no legitimate user would hit that asset. So when we have hundreds of different deception assets on our network, uh, any bad guy that hits it, that should trigger some type of response or alert. And the alert should be pretty rich because the uh, enterprise deception technology infrastructure will be able to trace uh, the path of the adversary as they've proceeded from the first infiltration of the network, first compromise of a system. And finally, high fidelity alerts, source-based forensics and real-time views for incident response, uh, the alerts will be generated with a series of, uh, of forensic details uh, based on the kill chain. So we followed what the bad guy has done as they've penetrated the network. That alert is very high fidelity and gives us the kind of source-based forensics and real-time view that we need to take immediate action. So the dwell time decreases, uh, our security analysts can be much more efficient and effective because they have the breadcrumb trail from the deception technology. So if you go to, this will be my last slide, the next slide, Tony. Uh, here were the reasons why threat detection and response was increasingly difficult from two years ago. And here's how deception technology uh, addresses those issues. So the volume of, and sophistication of threats has increased. Well, we can confront sophistication with deception. In other words, we don't have to look at everything that a threat actor will do. The threat actor, because they'll hit the deception decoys, will tell us what they're doing. And so we don't have to know all of the IOCs, all the TTPs of a threat actor, we just need to focus on what this particular attack did. 
uh, for immediate remediation. And then we can look broader uh, at, uh, at threat actors and what, they, what they've done and who they've attacked. Um, threat detection and response workload has increased. Well, we've, with deception, we can improve prevention, which will decrease the workload. And we can streamline analytics and operations because we have that breadcrumb trail of exactly what the adversary did. And the attack surface has grown. That is absolutely true. But the deception technology will look at the attack path and not the attack surface. So by doing that, you can focus your attention on, again, what the adversary is doing versus anything that they could possibly do across the attack surface. So thanks for listening in. I'll stick around for Q&A. Let me turn it over to my colleague, Tony, who can talk about the uh, lab validation that we did in conjunction with Elusive Networks. Thanks, John. Um, all great stuff. And we're going to now talk about how Elusive addresses those uh, challenges and issues. Um, so we evaluated uh, the Elusive Networks platform and our main focus was on validating the value of using Elusive Attack Pathway Discovery, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, and elimination to preempt attacks before they occur uh, using database deceptions that appear genuine and legitimate to protect against and respond to attacks. So also of uh, interest was the efficiency and ease of deployment, scalability, and the management of the platform. So um, I'm just gonna dive right into some of the testing that we did. Um, so the first thing that we looked at was automated attack path discovery. And it's exactly like John said, uh, it's not so much um, uh, what's being attacked, it's the, it's the path the attacker is taking that's really important and allows you to, to prevent things from happening before they're actually an issue. So. Now, um, the reason for that is that um, throughout an organization, credentials and connections proliferate, right? They proliferate across the network and attackers use threat tools like things like Mimikatz to automate and accelerate credential harvesting, network discovery and, and privilege escalation. So all of these are ways for them to learn what's on your network and to then get access to the things that they want to steal. So uh, the Elusive platform provides automatic discovery and mapping of the access footprint across your organization. So attack paths to high value systems uh, are then highlighted, uh, shown in red here. So once the attack paths are identified, uh, Elusive can then remove the conditions that are often exploited by attackers as they move laterally through the network. The Elusive platform also uncovers a, a wide gamut of basic yet frequently overlooked lateral movement paths that attackers use to move from a staging area, um, some um, system that they just happen to land on, um, uh, in, that's inside the perimeter of the organization, straight to the data that they want to steal, right? And including domain user credentials, lo local admin accounts, domain admin credentials on systems and devices across the organization, uh, shadow admins, saved connections to high value systems, all of this stuff, all of these things are ways that they will use to um, to move across your network and to get higher and higher access till they get to what they what they're looking for. So, having said all of that, um, this is that same network view that we just saw on the last screen, right? And this is after deceptions are deployed. So, all the each orange icon represents a deceptive user or system that's deployed on the network and and what their what their locations their apparent locations would be to anyone scanning the network. So when using deceptions, authenticity really is key, right? Um, if, it's, if you're not an, an authentic looking user, if it's not an authentic looking system, um, it sticks out, right? Especially to people who do this and who are experts at this, like the state sponsored actors. So attackers need to really believe that the deceptive data is real in order for deception to function effectively. Elusive deceptions are pushed out to endpoints and systems regularly, right? Uh, and this is done through a self-dissolving executable file. Um, the reason being that you don't want an agent sitting around on your on your systems that um, that can be um, that can be reverse engineered, that can be detected, right? So um, there's really no way to tell that Elusive has actually done anything on the system because 
the executable destroys itself. Um, traffic sent between elusive management server and an organization's endpoints is uh, pretty lightweight, and that's deliberate to minimize impact on remote sites. Because there's no uh, resident agents running on the endpoints, as I said, um, there's nothing for advanced attackers to spot or to circumvent. Deception uh, solutions that require an agent to get full deception and forensic capabilities from the, from the solution are traceable, right, as I mentioned before. Um, they're also susceptible, as I said, to reverse engineering. So um, the, the, the elusive platform's database deceptions are designed to appear genuine and legitimate, to lure them into engagement, and ultimately identify and stop them. These deceptions can be placed on the attack paths that were cleaned up by the elusive platform in the previous um, uh, slide and can reveal attackers on the network as soon as they attempt to make any move laterally. So, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, it's important to note here that uh, deceptions are created, all those deceptions that you saw are created automatically by the platform without administrator intervention. Um, in, in this uh, area, we just were looking at how an analyst could deploy a custom advanced deception manually, uh, but generally the, the, the process is deceptions get created and all you really need to do is go in and approve them. And that's what most users do. Um, so this is the deceptive user's view. And uh, essentially it took just a few clicks, right, for, for us to define the parameters that fit the environment that we were working in and generate as many deceptive users as we desired. So, um, you know, we, we could have with those same few clicks, click uh, created a couple or thousands. And the system would go off and take care of that and then build them all automatically. So. Everything that's generated is visible in Active Directory and it looks very much like a real user. So the platform also leverages uh, real inactive users that are you know, things that, that you would normally go through and wanna clean up out of your uh, Active Directory. Um, Elusive uses that to its, its advantage because that's then something that's actually really there and belonged there at one time. So anyhow, <clears throat> having said that, we next looked at uh, deceptive servers. And as with deceptive users, um, Elusive discovers inactive servers in Active Directory and uses them to create authentic deceptions. The orange icons on the left identify server deceptions that were generated by Elusive, right? Automatically generated by Elusive, created using normal naming conventions uh, that were learned in the discovery um, process and configured using data that was analyzed from active real systems. Uh, the servers with the gray icons at the bottom are real servers, inactive ones uh, that are, are um, uh, just still lingering in Active Directory uh, then, then, that are then being used as deceptions. So uh, next we took a look at um, deployment, uh, efficiency, and uh, ease of use essentially of the platform. Uh, Elusive is engineered, the, the platform is engineered to easily scale deceptions up to millions of endpoints. And that's, um, Essentially, up to 150,000 endpoints can be protected using just one server. Uh, Elusive aims to address the massive volume of alerts, as uh, John had mentioned before, replete with um, you know, false positives that organizations need to investigate before they can be confirmed as attacks. Elusive arms security operations center employees, uh, pe all the people in the SOC, with a low volume of high fidelity incident notification reports uh, with immediately actionable information to stop attacks. So with this data, the SOC and IT can be more self-sufficient and less reliant on other departments to carry out complete incident investigations. Um, so first, the platform communicates with Active Directory using, using an account just to understand all users, configurations, and values to identify what machines are the highest value assets. And uh, once discovery is complete, um, organizations can set the desired operational method for host access, right? So that um, can be done through Sys Internals, uh, WMI, uh, the uh, SCCM, now the Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager, or, or Tanium, uh, all, all those work. External tools like Blade Logic, Chef, and others are, are also available. And Elusive provides a parent key to the management server, and discovery happens completely in the background. The point and click interface to define policies. Uh, that are appropriate to each type of endpoint is pretty simple to use. Uh, we were able to assign and unassign policies at, at will 
really vast with just a couple of clicks. Although uh, Elusive automates routine functions at scale, right, the platform also allows for human oversight um, as needed. So in, uh, in uh, manual mode, uh, in, so in manual mode, once an analyst has reviewed the suggested deceptions, they're then deployed through a one-click process. So uh, next we wanted to take a look at what does an incident really look like? So we triggered an incident to observe the forensics and response uh, that are deployed by Elusive to detect and remediate the threat. So this is, a, you know, we simulated an actor that was inside the perimeter that had um, um, begun to try to move um, just to see what would happen there. So we ran Mimikatz on a system in the test network and uh, we obtained a set of saved credentials off that system. The credentials were essentially indistinguishable from legitimate uh, credentials that uh, had already been observed on the network. So with those credentials, uh, we attempted to log in to SharePoint. So while the system looked like it was authenticating us, uh, that, that looked completely legit, um, <clears throat> what was really happening was that forensics were taken from the endpoint that we were working on, that we were running Mimikatz on, and an alert was triggered on the Elusive platform. So um, the incident details that you see here, uh, you see a portion of here, contain uh, really a wealth of, of detail about the incident, including the machine the attempt was ex executed from, which you'd expect, uh, the last user to log into that machine, the site uh, that the login was attempted against, and then detailed analysis of all the collected data, including source destination, the triggering process, which deception was triggered, and um, Elusive also collects a screenshot, and you're able to look at that screenshot to basically see um, the login attempt in process, right? What was actually happening at the moment that the deception was triggered. So uh, one other thing that we did after um, we did our testing was talked to two organizations that are actually using Elusive in production in the real world. Uh, two large customers, a US-based financial services organization and a multinational company that uh, works in the en energy sector. Both organizations are using Elusive on their production networks and our goal was to just understand how they're using it and what the impact uh, has been on their business. And both organizations uh, told us they were impressed by the ease of deployment, by the deep visibility provided by Elusive, uh, and more importantly, both organizations found that Elusive was able to prevent attacks uh, using deception technology and uh, even uncovering attacks that had gone completely undetected by their existing tools, and it enabled them to stop the attacks and remediate those systems quickly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, and again, these are, you know, we had a, you know, these are uh, you know, small, uh, rather medium sized to a fairly large organization. But again, this 120 seat uh, place is able to do all this with a, a, a very um, compact, efficient footprint uh, from, uh, from Elusive as well. And that was something they communicated to us. So <clears throat> why does this all matter, right? What essentially is um, the bigger truth here? So it's clear that most organizations find acquiring um, cybersecurity staff, especially those with the necessary cybersecurity skills, a challenging situation to say the least, right? That's been something that we've been seeing and, and, and hearing from organizations for years and years, right? The skills gap is, uh, is wide. Uh, the skills gap is impactful. Uh, the number of security incidents that businesses must investigate and respond to has been steadily increasing as well. Uh, as you saw in uh, on John's earlier slides, uh, along with all the sophistication and complexity of those attacks. Um, detection tools are generating more alerts, and that makes identifying and remediating modern cybersecurity incident a daunting task. So exacerbating this, uh, the skills shortage is continuing unabated, and um, uh, actually the, um, excuse me, <clears throat> In our last survey, 44% of organizations said they have a problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills. Um, and two thirds said they'll increase their budget relative to last year. CISOs clearly see the need to invest in solutions that make their existing staff more productive, more effective, and more efficient. So we validated that we could use the Elusive platform to deploy deception sensors across the network with just a few mouse clicks. 
the effort was the same to deploy one or thousands of decoys. Um, the automation and flexibility of the system made it really fast and easy to configure deceptions to mimic the characteristics of existing hosts and users on the network. Uh, so the, um, this really comes down to is um, that the elusive platform utilizes existing network connectivity, requires only minimal configuration of DNS services, and so enables a centralized management process for flat and distributed networks without the need for uh, VLAN or tunnel configuration. Uh, so keeping it very um, keeping it very simple. We found that this speeds deployment, right? It simplifies management, minimizes the number of systems that are required to operate the software. When you take all this together, these capabilities uh, reduce operational staffing and support requirements. It frees up valuable resources for more strategic activities. Uh, Elusive's uh, lightweight database deceptions also minimize those hardware requirements, uh, reduce required maintenance, and uh, eliminate the need for network upgrades. So. I mean, essentially, our, our conclusion here is that if your organization is looking to, um, to not just uh, reduce the attack surface, but to, um, to, to supercharge your, um, your protection using the power of database deceptions, uh, or some, uh, um, that elusive is definitely worth a very close and serious look. So um, that is all that I had specifically on the validation. So I'll turn it back to Elusive. We can spend a little bit of time on uh, q and I really appreciate everyone's time today and uh, having the opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you, Tony. And thank you, John, before that, uh, from Enterprise Strategy Group. Uh, Nir, you can share your screen when you are ready. Um, I'm gonna turn things over to Nir Greenberg, who is the Senior Director of Field Engineering and Customer Success at Elusive Networks. Uh, Nir, over to you. Great. Can you hear me well? Yes. All right. And you can see the screen well as well. Yes. Excellent. All right. So um, I'll speak specifically about um, uh, some use cases that um, a few of our customers, um, you know, experience with with our product uh, to the different uh, capabilities of it. So um, uh, the folks at DSG mentioned uh, things around our attack surface management capabilities and uh, the deceptions capabilities uh, and also the forensics capabilities. So I'll, I'll try to add some more color into uh, the different capabilities while I'm, I'm talking about the different use cases. Um, so the first use case that um, that I wanted to share with you guys is um, an interesting uh, incident that happened to us at one of our clients. Um, basically what happened is that um, there was a user that was trying to um, escalate their privileges. Um, and unfortunately for them, they used one of our deceptive users. Um, now that was that was a regular user from from the organization. So uh, uh, the folks from from the SOC reached out, um, asked uh, the person uh, what's going on and and were you doing anything uh, um, like that? And and the user was like um, talking about some some malware that was uh, that he downloaded by mistake. And the timeline didn't end up uh, very well for for the SOC uh, folks because um, this malware that he was referring to was installed on his computer or uh, launches on his computer 15 minutes after this call from the SOC. So they put, him, put this, this person on, on a blacklist or, or a monitoring list for a while. And then eventually uh, they realized that this person and also the supervisor uh, were part of this uh, money laundry campaign that was running for um, around 22 months, um, basically three months after this person joined, joined the company. Uh, we're talking about millions of dollars um, and, and that involves shell companies and um, this, this story goes on. Uh, but in general, the, the, main, the main focus here is that it requires only one mistake, uh, in this case by the malicious uh, uh, user, malicious insider user, uh, that you won't expect them to do something like that, but obviously 
uh, one mistake uh, allowed the people to um, to understand what what was going on, and then they were able to start with a deeper forensics investigation. Um, the second use case that I wanted to to share with you is uh, also around the malicious insider. I mean, these uh, COVID nineteen uh, days, we are hearing more and more. Uh, needs around uh, this use case um, and in this specific uh, uh, situation uh, what we were seeing is that um, this user was was actually trying to interact with uh, one of our deceptive servers deceptive share servers in specific um, and basically downloaded um, a lot of information uh, from our our trap server, from our, our interaction server. So uh, PowerPoints that he downloaded and, and Word uh, documents and PDF and, and what have you. Um, the problem is that all of them were deceptive. Um, now, interesting enough, um, this person copied all this information into a PowerPoint and then leaked it out because he knew that DL, their DLP is not uh, um, enforcing anything on, on PowerPoints. And then, then we realized basically that this person was doing that for the past five and a half months. Um, and obviously this was something that was not identified until we implemented the solution uh, into this uh, organization. The third uh, use case, speaking more about um, um, an, an outsider, so more about um, um, national, I would say, uh, nation state uh, attacks. Um, and in this case, what was happening there is um, this, um, this group, I would say, it was two specific groups that were identified uh, during this ex exercise um, on this, uh, this ISP in, in this specific uh, use case. Um, interestingly enough, the, the customer was this, this uh, organization that we, was working, we were working with, they were under the impression that they have completely segregated networks. The problem is that they had one server, it was one old server that was in their network for a forgotten, forgotten project that basically had a leg to each and every of the segregated networks, which basically caused the bridge between the six networks and allow the attackers to move around uh, the network uh, without being detected. So once they, uh, once they use one of our deceptions, in this case, it was um, a web-based uh, web deceptions, we were able to identify their tracks using, um, using our forensics capabilities, were able to find um, their, their tools and techniques that they were using, um, and no other tool was able to detect the attacker's presence. And I'm talking about uh, an organization that has any tool that you can, you can think about from security perspective. Um, another one that happened during the COVID-19 days um, that was uh, pretty, uh, pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, it was very, very fast. Uh, it was around seven days of, of APT. Uh, we're the, we were the, the first to detect. Um, so we're talking about um, um, an engagement that we had with the with client. Uh, we're able to, to detect this case of TrickBot and, and the Bazaar backdoor. Uh, we're able to identify that the attackers managed to compromise 30 machines uh, and six hyper accounts in those seven days. Um, interestingly enough, they started on uh, some uh, server that, that serves uh, the printers uh, in the organization, which is uh, very common. Um, and also we were able to identify a lot of never seen before tools um, and also provide the IOCs for, for the customer. Um, we were engaged with uh, uh, another IR firm to uh, basically use our ASM and forensics on-demand capabilities because you can actually launch the forensics on demand uh, to any endpoint that you like. So if you have uh, a suspicious that uh, there is a comp compromised uh, machine, you can actually use our API capabilities using your store or on demand uh, from our console and then get all the information that we collect uh, that the folks at ESG mention about uh, network information, um, MFD data, partial history, command line history, and so on. 
Um, and that was all around um, uh, trying to, to, to run um, a full ransomware campaign on, on this organization. And interestingly enough, everything was related uh, to a phishing campaign uh, around the COVID-19. So termination letters uh, and, and so on and so forth. Things that are, are not so easy to identify as, as an actual phishing, uh, phishing email. Um, the, last, the last use case that I do want to share with you uh, is, is not about malicious activity, but it is more around mistakes that we do um, as, as people in the organization. Um, so from, from our perspective, um, when, there is a, uh, when there is a user that is uh, accessing a certain server and supposed to do their job um, and by mistakenly uh, doing something else, this is also not good for, this or for, for the organizations. In this case, what happened is that um, we were able to reveal a connection that was coming from two specific servers within the organization. One of the servers was, um, uh, was marked as a crown jewel uh, because it, it hosted um, federal classified, classified federal uh, data. Um, and basically what happened is that by mistake, um, the, the two developers that were working on, on the other server uh, were actually copying um, classified data by mistake. Uh, luckily for them, they were able to prove that they, they didn't use this data or they didn't open it. It was just for uh, a backup purposes, if I remember correctly, um, and, and therefore were able to identify that there was um, a misconfiguration um, on, on the organization part um, and obviously could lead to, to a data breach. And all of that could, could have been uh, identified by our attack surface manager visually from, from the map itself. I'll, I'll wrap up and then I'll move it back to Jason, um, but mainly about our key values that are coming from customers. So the first one we're talking about the, the detection effectiveness. Um, the fact that we're able to, uh, to bring uh, true positives and, and not just false positive or a lot of false positive as you see from other security solution, this is something that our customers like the most. Um, that they don't need to deal with uh, with many alerts, but when the the alert is coming, uh, they know they need to start uh, running. Um, and then also from the detection in terms of of steps. So how many steps does it take us um, to detect the malicious activity? So we see over 121 red team exercises, audits. Uh, penetration testing from different organizations in the world that were able to detect the attackers very early from the breach point. Uh, so we're talking about uh, in, in here in, in three steps. That's normally what we get from, uh, from our customers from their environments. But in general, throughout all of these exercises, we're talking about detecting the attackers in the first 24 hours. Um, so these are very good numbers because, um, as, as the folks at ESG mentioned in their slides, um, the fact that the deceptions are, are so authentic uh, basically disrupt the decision-making process of the attacker. And by that, all they had to do is, is basically just try and choose uh, uh, information to act upon it. And then once they choose wrong, we're able to detect them. Um, from the SOC efficiency perspective, we're getting comments from our customers of 90% uh, of response reductions to incidents. And, and the reason it happens is because of our unique uh, implement, implementation or, or deployment of our forensics uh, binary to the endpoints because we're not using a resident agent. We're not using a permanent agent on, on the system. So you can fire it away from your SOAR, from, from the demistos of the world, um, and, and from the simplifies of the world, and, and you name it. Um, and, and basically, you can get the forensics information immediately uh, from the endpoint, and that, will, that allows the, the SOC folks and the IR people um, to basically make a decision. Um, did I see something on this endpoint that requires me to quarantine this computer, for example? Um, so they are able to make decisions much faster 
and we're able to, the, the comments we got were uh, 90%, so from six hours to, to minutes of investigations and, and response. And then the second comment was around 75% uh, of, of uh, response reduction to, to incidents from another organization. Um, the attack surface reduction speaks about uh, attack surface manager. Uh, so um, being able to identify errant connections and, and user credentials that were used um, internally uh, between systems or someone at some point of time ran a script from task scheduler on, a, on, a other, on another computer and they are using a high privilege, high privilege uh, user in order to perform this, um, this uh, uh, access and, and running their, uh, their actions. Uh, so we are able to basically highlight them, prioritize it based on the severity of them, and then also eliminate them. We can actually uh, remove uh, connections, uh, disconnected RDP sessions, for example, users from credentials, uh, uh, Windows Credentials uh, Manager, um, and connections to the cloud, identify connections between uh, the on-premise domain and your uh, uh, Azure uh, domain, for example. So we're able to give you a better understanding of your environment from the attacker's perspective. Um, and this is, the, uh, this is basically the, the last presentation or the last slide that I will share with you today. And with that, I'll move it to you, uh, Jason. Great, thank you very much, Nir. Um, at this point, uh, if there are any questions from the audience, a reminder that you can ask questions um, in the Q&A tab on the webinar control panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I wanted to mention a couple of other things uh, while um, we'll give time for questions to come in. One of which is we have these webinars almost weekly, sometimes uh, uh, once every two weeks. Um, we have a webinar coming up next week on SOC efficiency, uh, and we will uh, be sending out an email uh, soon and doing some promotion on that. Uh, so if you can join us, that would be great. Uh, secondly, um, the ESG technical validation uh, paper uh, that was referenced in today's webinar um, is available both on our website, but also we'll send it to all registrants of this webinar uh, in a follow-up email so you can read the full report. Um, and you can also watch the recording as well. Um, so there are just a couple of questions that came in. One was, um, John, maybe you want to take this one, uh, but it was talking about that there's different types of deceptions, as you mentioned. There's like a decoy servers, and then there's, you know, endpoint uh, deceptive data. Um, just what the benefits are of both, or where when you might use. Uh, different use cases for when you might use each? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so the traditional honeypot server is just that, it's a server. Uh, most of the time those were deployed for research purposes. So, and they still are. So anyone who's doing threat intelligence gathering probably has honeypots deployed throughout the world uh, on somewhere on the, in data centers on the internet backbone. Um, in, a, in an enterprise environment, uh, honeypot is probably still used for research purposes, but may also be used to deceive as a deception decoy that mimics a server. So for instance, a database server. Now that's a good technique, uh, but it assumes that that's the target of the bad guys. Uh, we know that cyber attacks most often emanate through some type of uh, exploit of an endpoint, Typically that's either via the web or email, and a lot of it is due to phishing or social engineering. So therefore, if you instrument endpoints with deception technology, you're likely to catch the beginnings of an attack. And then if you instrument uh, endpoints or systems around the network, so things like uh, domain servers and, uh, and and the likes of those, then you're likely to see the way the attack progresses. So I'd say that what, what, what's really important to understand is that deception technology has evolved and where it was once really primarily 
<clears throat> excuse me, for research, it's now more for um, threat detection and response efficiency for the SOC. Great, thank you. Um, we had another question about, do we know of, maybe, maybe Nir, if you wanna uh, tackle this one, do we know of any efforts of, um, of attackers trying to detect elusive deceptions and how easy that or, or difficult that might be? It's actually a great question because um, there were some tools that were trying to do that. Um, mainly, mainly around, we saw them mainly around uh, uh, penetration testing that, that we have done. Um, but we saw all sorts of tools that, that are trying to, to trace our, our deceptions. And um, interestingly enough, when, when we were able to, uh, to take those tools and also check them uh, afterwards, uh, because they were publicly available, we saw that the tools themselves are not effective on the deceptions that we are able to deploy at our customers. Uh, so we want to make sure that those deceptions will be defined according to the best practices of our uh, of our policies, and then those tools will be uh, uh, not effective in identifying the deceptions that we planned uh, on the endpoint themselves. Um, so yeah, definitely a great question, and we see tools like that, and and we are waiting for for additional tools that that will come. Great. Um, so. Um... Well, if there are any other questions, uh, again, you still have another minute or two in the Q&A, but Nir, can you just go to um, the next slide? I just wanted to go through some next steps. Um, so firstly, uh, thank you to our presenters today, um, Nir Greenberg from Elusive Networks, but also uh, John uh, Olczyk from ESG, as well as Tony Palmer from uh, ESG as well. Um, but so you can, like I mentioned, you can read the full, um, technical validation report, which you'll get in an email, but if not, you can also go to our resources page, which is at elusivenetworks.com slash resources. Um, and there you can also find other webinar recordings, white papers, case studies, um, and other valuable pieces of information about deception and about um, cyber security um, more generally. Um, likewise, you can uh, visit our blog. Uh, we have a number of recent um, blog articles specifically talking about some of the unique challenges uh, during the working from home uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. That's at elusivenetworks.com slash blog. You can also follow us on our social channels, uh, which you can see on the screen here on Twitter or on LinkedIn, uh, as well as request a demo if you're interested in seeing uh, a live demo about um, the, elusive, the various aspects of the Elusive platform um, and how we can help your organization with your security challenges. Um, so I don't see any other questions at this time. So I would like to thank uh, everyone for joining. Um, have a great rest of the day and stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.